Welcome to Bryce Canyon National Park, a United States National Park located in southwestern Utah. The major feature of the park is Bryce Canyon, which, despite its name, is not a canyon, but a collection of giant natural amphitheaters along the eastern side of the Ponsagunt Plateau. Bryce is distinctive due to geological features called hoodoos, formed by frost weathering and stream erosion of the river and lake bed sedimentary rocks that comprise the amphitheaters. The red, orange, and white colors of the rocks provide spectacular views for park visitors. Bryce sits at a much higher elevation than nearby Zion National Park. The rim at Bryce varies from 8,000 to 9,000 feet above sea level. The Bryce Canyon was settled by Mormon pioneers in the 1850s and was named after Ebenezer Bryce, who homesteaded in the area in 1874. The area around Bryce Canyon was originally designated as a national monument by President Warren G. Harding in 1923 and was redesignated as a national park by Congress in 1928. The park consists of 35,835 acres, making it 55.992 square miles in area, and it receives substantially fewer visitors than Zion National Park or Grand Canyon National Park, largely due to Bryce's more remote location. However, in 2016, Bryce Canyon received 2,365,110 recreational visitors, representing an increase of 35% over the previous year. Bryce Canyon National Park is located in southwestern Utah, about 50 miles northeast and 1,000 feet higher than Zion National Park. The weather in Bryce is therefore cooler and the park receives more precipitation, a total of 15 to 18 inches per year. Yearly temperatures vary from an average minimum of 9 degrees Fahrenheit in January to an average maximum of 83 degrees Fahrenheit in July, but extreme temperatures can range from minus 30 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit. The record high temperature in the park was 98 degrees Fahrenheit on July 14, 2002. The record low temperature was minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit on December 10, 1972. The national park lies within the Colorado Plateau geographic province of North America and straddles the southeastern edge of the Ponsagunt Plateau, west of the Ponsagunt Fault. Park visitors arrive from the plateau part of the park and look over the plateau's edge toward a valley containing the fault and the Paria River just beyond it. Bryce Canyon was not formed from erosion initiated from a central stream, and therefore it is technically not a canyon. Instead, headward erosion has excavated large amphitheater-shaped features in the Cenozoic-aged rocks of the Ponsagunt Plateau. This erosion exposed delicate and colorful pinnacles called hoodoos that are up to 200 feet high. A series of amphitheaters extends more than 20 miles north to south within the park. The largest is Bryce Amphitheater, which is 12 miles long, 3 miles wide, and 800 feet deep. A nearby example of amphitheaters with hoodoos in the same formation but at a higher elevation is the Cedar Breaks National Monument, which is 25 miles to the west of the Markagunt Plateau. Rainbow Point, the highest part of the park at 9,105 feet, is at the end of the 18-mile scenic drive. From there, Aquarius Plateau, Bryce Amphitheater, the Henry Mountains, the Vermilion Cliffs, and the White Cliffs can be seen. Yellow Creek, while it extends the park in the northeast direction, is the lowest part of the park at 6,620 feet. Nineteen species of ground squirrels occur in North America. Bryce Canyon is home to two species, the golden-mantled ground squirrel 
and the rock ground squirrel. Although the golden-mantled ground squirrel seen here is a traditional hibernator, and thus builds up its body fats to survive during the winter sleep, it is also known to store food in its burrow. In this way, it is much like the chipmunk. Both the golden-mantled ground squirrel and the chipmunk have cheek pouches for carrying food. Cheek pouches allow them to transport food back to their nests and still run at full speed on all fours. Golden-mantled ground squirrels dig shallow burrows up to 100 feet in length with the openings hidden in a hollow log or under tree roots or a boulder. The female gives birth to a single litter of four to six young each summer. Reaching speeds of more than 40 miles per hour, the pronghorn are the fastest land mammal in North America. Pronghorn migrate 44 miles on average from summer to winter range and have been documented to move as far as 157 miles. While bucks average approximately 120 pounds, does average about 110 pounds. The coat is rusty brown and tan with white neck bands, belly, and rump. Black cheek patches occur on males. Males also have horns that extend past the ears. Often this is 12 inches or more. The horns curve back with a single prong rising from the upper half of the horn and pointing forward. Horns on the females consist of only a small cone less than an inch long. Pronghorn are a landscape scale species that require large blocks of open continuous habitat. Sagebrush plains and short grass prairie associated with open terrain are common places that they call home. Of course, pronghorns are herbivores. Their favorite food consists of a variety of forbs, followed by grass species and shrubs. Some of the common plants they eat include milk, vetch, aster, blue grama, wheat grasses, and sagebrush. Breeding peaks in mid-September, with bucks tending to harems of 5 to 20 or more does. Gestation averages 252 days. One to three fawns, usually two, are born in late May to late June, and they weigh about 8 pounds each. Their coat is tan, with black on the hair tips. Prairie dogs are burrowing rodents. The Utah prairie dog is the westernmost of the five prairie dog species that inhabit North America. Limited to the southwestern quarter of Utah, the Utah prairie dog has the most restricted range of all prairie dog species. Utah prairie dogs are tawny to reddish brown in color with short white tip tails and a black eyebrow above each eye, a marking that distinguishes them from other prairie dog species. They are thought to be closer related to the white-tailed prairie dog. Unlike the black-tailed prairie dogs of the Great Plains, Utah prairie dogs hibernate. Prairie dogs are among the most social of animals. They live together in large groups called colonies or towns. Most colonies have numerous burrows with a network of entrances allowing easy retreats but also quick escape. Paiute Indians occupied the area around what is now Bryce Canyon starting around 1200 AD. The Ponsagunt Plateau was used for seasonal hunting and gathering activities, but there is no evidence of permanent settlements. The legend of Bryce Canyon was explained to a park naturalist in 1936 by Indian Dick, a Paiute leader who then lived in the Kaiba Reservation. Before there were humans, the legend people, Tuwenangungwa, lived in that place. There were many of them. They were of many kinds, birds, animals, lizards, and such things. But they looked like people. They were not people. They had power to make themselves look that way. For some reason, the legend people in that place were bad. They did something that was not good, perhaps a fight, perhaps they stole something. The tale is not clear at this point. Because they were bad, Coyote turned them all into rocks. You can see them in that place now, all turned into rocks. Some standing in rows, some sitting down, some holding onto others. 
You can see their faces with paint on them, just the way they were before they became rocks. The name of the place is Anka Kuwasawitz, Red Painted Faces. This is the story the people tell. It was not until the late 18th and early 19th century that the first European Americans explored the remote and hard to reach area. Mormon scouts visited the area in the 1850s to gauge its potential for agricultural development, use for grazing, and settlement. The first major scientific expedition to the area was led by U.S. Army Major John Wesley Powell in 1872. Powell, along with a team of map makers and geologists, surveyed the Severe and Virgin River area as part of a larger survey of the Colorado Plateaus. His map makers kept many of the Paiute place names. Small groups of Mormon pioneers followed and attempted to settle east of Bryce Canyon along the Pariah River. In 1873, the Canara Cattle Company started to use the area for cattle grazing. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sent Scottish immigrant Ebenezer Bryce and his wife Mary to settle the land in the Pariah Valley because they thought his carpentry skills would be useful in the area. The Bryce family chose to live right below Bryce Amphitheater, the main collection of hoodoos in the park. Bryce grazed his cattle inside what are now park borders and reputedly thought that the amphitheaters were, quote, a hell of a place to lose a cow, unquote. He also built a road to the plateau to retrieve firewood and timber and a canal to irrigate his crops and water his animals. Other settlers soon started to call the unusual place Bryce's Canyon which was later formalized into Bryce Canyon. A combination of drought, overgrazing, and flooding eventually drove the remaining Paiutes from the area and prompted the settlers to attempt construction of a water diversion channel from the severe river drainage. When that effort failed, most of the settlers, including the Bryce family, left the area. Bryce moved his family to Arizona in 1880. The remaining settlers dug a 10-mile ditch from the Severe's East Fork into Tropic Valley. The Bryce Canyon scenes were first described for the public in magazine articles published by Union Pacific and Santa Fe Railroads in 1916. People such as Forest Supervisor J.W. Humphrey promoted the scenic wonders of Bryce Canyon's amphitheaters, and by 1918, nationally distributed articles also helped to spark interest. However, poor access to the remote area and the lack of accommodations kept visitation to a bare minimum. Ruby Syret, Harold Bowman, and Perry Brothers later built modest lodging and set up touring services in the area. Surrett later served as the first postmaster of Rice Canyon. At the same time, conservationists became enlarged by the damage, overgrazing, logging, and unregulated visitation were having on the fragile features of Rice Canyon. A movement to have the area protected was soon started and National Park Service Director Stephen Mather responded by proposing that Bryce Canyon be made into a state park. The governor of Utah and the Utah State Legislature, however, lobbied for national protection of the area. Mather relented and sent his recommendation to President Warren G. Harding, who, on June 8, 1923, declared Bryce Canyon a national monument. A road was built the same year on the plateau to provide easy access to outlooks over the amphitheaters. From 1924 to 1925, Bryce Canyon Lodge was built from local timber and stone. Members of the United States Congress started work in 1924 on upgrading Bryce Canyon's protection status from a national monument to a national park in order to establish Utah National Park. A process led by the Utah Parks Company for transferring ownership 
of private and state-held land in the monument to the federal government started in 1923. The last of the land in the proposed park's borders was sold to the federal government four years later, and on February 25, 1928, the renamed Bryce Canyon National Park was established. In 1931, President Herbert Hoover annexed an adjoining area south of the park, and in 1942, an additional 635 acres was added as well. This brought the park's total area to the current figure of 35,835 acres. Rim Road, the scenic drive that is still used today, was completed in 1934 by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Administration of the park was conducted from neighboring Zion National Park until 1956, when Bryce Canyon's first superintendent started work. Turning our attention now to the Bryce Canyon geology, we can note that Bryce Canyon area shows a record of sedimentary deposition that spans from about 75 to 35 million years ago, a time from the late Cretaceous to about halfway through the Cenozoic. The ancient depositional environment of the region around what is now the park is varied. The Dakota sandstone and the trophic shale were deposited in the warm, shallow waters of the advancing and retreating Cretaceous Seaway. Outcrops of these rocks are found just outside the park boundaries. The colorful Claron Formation, from which the park's delicate hoodoos are carved, was laid down as sediments in a system of cool streams and lakes that existed from 63 to 40 million years ago, from the Paleocene to the Eocene epochs. Different sediment types were laid down as the lakes deepened and became shallow and as the shoreline and river deltas migrated. Several other formations were also created but were mostly eroded away following two major periods of uplift. The Laramide orogeny affected the entire western portion of what would become North America starting about 70 million to 50 million years ago. This event helped to build the Rocky Mountains and, in the process, closed the Cretaceous Seaway. The Strait Cliffs, Waweep, and Kaiparowitz formations were victims of this uplift. The Colorado Plateaus were uplifted 16 million years ago and were segmented into different plateaus, each separated from its neighbor by faults and each having its own uplift rate. The Boat Mesa conglomerate and the Severe River Formation were formed by erosion Very following broken. this uplift. This uplift created vertical joints which over time were preferentially eroded. The soft pink cliffs of the Claron Formation were eroded to form freestanding pinnacles in badlands called hoodoos, while the more resistant white cliffs formed monoliths. The average weight of a mule deer ranges from 130 pounds at one year of age to 250 pounds later in life. The actual size and weight of each subspecies does vary with location. As with the white-tailed deer, the farther south in North America one goes, generally the smaller the size of the deer. When first born, fawns usually weigh five to seven pounds. The color of the mule deer's coat changes with the seasons, from short reddish-brown in the summer to longer grayish-tan in the winter months. A major defining characteristic for the mule deer is the noticeably large ears, in comparison to its cousin, the white-tailed deer, which has relatively small ears. Mule deer have a short white tail with a black tip. When running, mule deer tend to run more on the tips of their hooves, allowing them to run faster. Mule deer antler growth starts in the spring with warming temperatures. During the growth period, the antlers are covered in a skin-like tissue called velvet. All mule deer antlers are bifurcated, which means they fork as they grow. Full growth is obtained in late summer when the velvet is shed. The red fox is found throughout the northern hemisphere in Europe, Asia, and North America. Its range extends 
south into northern Africa and into the northern regions of India and Vietnam in Asia and Mexico on the North American continent. The red fox is a carnivore but has a wide range of tolerated food types. Foxes will hunt and eat rabbits, mice, voles, birds, and insects but are less likely to eat shrews or voles. Foxes will eat any carrion or animal waste that they might encounter. They scavenge road kills, trash dumps, livestock offal piles, and garbage cans. Returning now to considering the Bryce Canyon geology, we can note that the brown, pink, and red colors are from hematite, an iron oxide of the chemical formula Fe2O3. The yellows from limonite, and the purples are from pyrolusite. Arches were also created, as well as natural bridges, walls, and windows. Hoodoos are composed of soft sedimentary rock and are topped by a piece of harder, less easily eroded sandstone that protects the column from the elements. Bryce Canyon has one of the highest concentrations of hoodoos of any place on Earth. The formations exposed in the area of the park are part of the Grand Staircase. The oldest members of the super sequence of rock units are exposed in the Grand Canyon, the intermediate ones in Zion National Park, and its youngest parts are laid bare in Bryce Canyon area. A small amount of overlap occurs in and around each park. Considering now the Bryce Canyon National Park ecology, we can note that 400 native plant species live in the park. There are three life zones in the park based on elevations. The lowest areas of the park are dominated by dwarf forests of pinyon pine and juniper with manzanita, serviceberry, and antelope bitterbrush in between aspen, cottonwood, water birch, and willow, which grow along the streams. Ponderosa pine forests cover the mid-elevations with blue spruce and Douglas fir in water-rich areas, and manzanita and bitterbrush as underbrush. Douglas fir and white fir, along with aspen and Engelmann spruce, make up the forests of the Ponsagunt Plateau. The harshest areas have limber pine an ancient Great Basin bristlecone pine, some more than 1,600 years old, still holding on. The forests and meadows of Bryce Canyon provide the habitat to support diverse animal life, including foxes, badgers, porcupines, elk, black bears, bobcats, and woodpeckers. Mule deer are the most common large mammals in the park, Elk and pronghorn, which have been reintroduced nearby, sometimes venture into the park as well. Bryce Canyon National Park forms part of the habitat of three wildlife species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. These include the Utah prairie dog, the California condor, 
and the southwestern willow flycatcher. The Utah prairie dog is a threatened species that was reintroduced to the park for conservation, and the largest protected population is found within the park's boundaries. About 170 species of birds visit the park each year, including swifts and swallows. Most species migrate to warmer regions in winter, although jays, ravens, nuthatches, eagles, and owls remain. In winter, the mule deer, cougars, and coyotes migrate to lower elevations. Ground squirrels and marmots pass the winter in hibernation. Eleven species of reptiles and four species of amphibians have been found in the park. Reptiles include the Great Basin Rattlesnake, Shorthorn Lizard, Side Blotched Lizard, Striped Whip Snake, and the Tiger Salamander. Also in the park are the black, lumpy, very slow growing colonies of cryptobiotic soil, which are a mix of lichens, algae, fungi, and cyanobacteria. Together these organisms slow erosion, add nitrogen to the soil, and help it to retain moisture.
Might take a second to double check our map. We actually started over at a different point and we walked through and we're going to take the shuttle back. Oh, okay. So that's, oh, that's you can do cool. that kind of thing too. There's two different, you can go up the Navajo or you can go up the Peekaboo. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, depending if you want to log.